Okay. To shrink all that down into two or three questions and a three or four minute answer. I think the most important thing is I met him toward the end of his life at a time that he was already established as a pastor. His life led him along the path of studying, philosophy, writing, his time as a convert to the Orthodox Church, his initial, initial years in the monastery, and there are struggles to publish the Orthodox Word in some books. And then he was ordained diaconate and priesthood. And I already met him really at the crown of all that work. So I'm very fortunate because I think I met him at a time when he was able to use all the gifts that he had and he had developed and to combine that with his experience in, let's say, the Orthodox mission at that time. And so, I saw how he guided the brothers of the monastery. Those people who simply read something he's written, or which is primarily how most people know him, or who knew him on some sort of parish visits or something like that, didn't really see, get a glimpse into how he was guiding the brothers on a daily basis. So if what I gathered, maybe for me that was the most important thing. He was very blunt. I remember one time he came by, he was doing a little project, and he said, did you get a blessing for that? Meaning, what on earth is going on here? <laughs> and I was like, well, I really didn't exactly have a blessing. It's kind of something I just kind of decided to do. Other times, things that I saw, what I benefited from is when I would walk through the dark in the morning to church. See, we weren't so sophisticated back then. We didn't have those uh, motion sensor lights that would come on as you walked by that would light the path ahead of you. And sometimes we had to walk through a crunch through the snow to church early in the morning. And it was usually more or less the first or second person to church every day. About 365 or 363 days a year. And was quietly praying or lighting the lamps or had already begun the morning prayers. And when you see that on a daily basis, you have an idea of the character of the person who's there. So he came there to pray, to immerse himself in the services. And he was focused. He didn't sit around and chat or come by and ask you questions. And I had to <clears throat> also, one of the other things that I gathered from him, some of you now, we're all kind of spoiled. We have access to things such as the prologue from Creed, for example. And those of you who have a copy of that know that every day there's these little accounts, the lives of the saints for the day. Then there is a passage for consideration. Certain editions have the poems. And then there is a little sermon. Usually about three, four paragraphs maximum. And St. Nikolai Vilimitrovich was able to create a little three or four paragraph sermon. Some of you might wish that your own priest limited his paragraphs to three or four sermons. Okay. But it's, it's a skill to say what you need to say in that short little segment. And so he did that every morning on the epistle and gospel for the day, primarily. A short little word 
that we had every morning. And he would do something similar at the end of the meals, too. He would give a word of instruction. And those are the kind of most powerful things that I recall. One other thing is, is he also had this little course he had. It's known by different names, Orthodox Survival Course, things like that. So we had usually about twice a week, little morning class, one of those sections where it was something he'd been working on for years, part of his kind of dream work, the kingdom of God and kingdom of man, putting it all together, never totally in a book form. And those are the things that I value, that I remember, that I received. And primarily, that's how I remember him. So there's a, a little phrase of his that began to be repeated regularly. It's lighter than you think, hasten therefore to do the work of God or will of God. In a way, this is related to a popular phrase that people repeat about St. Herman of Alaska, who said, from this day, from this uh, hour, from this minute, let us learn to love God above all and to do his holy will. Okay. I think it was also very popular because in the uh, 70s, early 80s, there was a very strong kind of apocalyptic current accentuated by writings such as uh, Hal Lindsey's Lake Great Planet Earth, about which Father Seraphim did used to have a little humorous remark that he had to keep making a new edition. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, but I think for him, for him, it was reality that, uh, of course, we do not know the time we don't know the day. We don't know the hour. God does not reveal this. Jesus Christ says that uh, only the Father knows, meaning human beings do not know. And it's not revealed to us. And therefore, we're to be ready. We're to be watchful. And so for the Feast of St. John of the Ladder, that's one of the chapters in the Ladder of Divine Ascent, by the way, is on watchfulness. Christians are to be watchful. We don't have a guarantee about when we're supposed to start repenting. We do it now. And that's why we're supposed to live with a clean conscience. We're not supposed to tell them, oh, wait, find out when the world's coming, then repent, and uh, then we'll be all right. It could happen any time. And fortunately, with his disposition, Father Seraphim was, uh, felt very ready. And it just turns out in his life, this was providential, that he, he was ready to depart and be with God. He wasn't waiting for a time when somehow he would then get ready. And so all of us, all of us are to live according to our conscience, to live God-pleasing life and be ready for the coming of Christ. It's not something that will be announced. So I, I think in general that's, I think, the best way to look at that. So that's a fascinating question because in the 1980s, he died in 1982, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, beginning of September. And his, uh, his, because of that timing and his writings, as the Christian faith began to open up in Russia in the 1980s, late 70s, had a really powerful impact on the opening uh, of the rebirth of Orthodox faith in the former Soviet Union. In fact, one time I was on a, this really <clears throat> kind of remote area in northern Georgia, and this man said, somebody's talking, and he said, I have a copy of this book. I have a copy, a typescript copy of this. In other words, it was uh, what they did in those days. Most of you don't remember these things because you're just too young. We had this thing called the mimeograph machine. So you typed out this uh, on this mimeograph paper, and they would copy these copies. So what happens? They go and copy these after work in their public offices, 
And instead of doing, say, 500 copies, they would use the same sheet to try to get 3,000 copies. So the last 2,000 copies were really hard to read. <laughs> but they'd put them together, and they'd do them, and it was all unauthorized, etc. And they had these books put together, sometimes stapled or stitched by hand. Uh, often just something clever to what would be, what is it, A3 paper? Like eight and a half by 11, but European size? Somebody knows this, okay. And people treasured these things for years. So it was about, maybe at that time, about 1999, when that man told me. So he probably had one that was 17, 18, 20 years old or something like that. Okay, what in, here in our country today, the importance, okay. Here was a man who was able, during his time, precisely, precisely during the 1970s, to look at what was taking place here in the United States in the religious ferment of that time, that is the 1970s, which is totally different from today. That is, what people believe, the religious currents, the questions people were asking, what was taking place in society, philosophically, religiously, politically, to address the questions of that day that concerned Christians and Orthodox Christians and be able to make, formulate a response to them. Really, I think that's his primary importance. Now, in the 2022, our questions mostly are totally different than they were in the 1970s. People are not coming out of a Jonathan Livingston Seagull movie and asking starry-eyed questions, okay? They're not necessarily reading Shirley MacLaine and then asking questions about spirituality. Okay? Our questions are different. People are not somehow today uh, obsessed by the ecumenical movement. Those questions are kind of, that's not what people are asking today. They're asking different questions. So, for us then, our task is to respond to the questions that people have today, but to respond to them as Orthodox Christians who live their faith, know their faith, have read the Fathers of the Church, and can make a response on behalf of the Church for today. And so I think that's really the proper way to look at and understand what Father Seraphim did and why he's important, because that's what he did specifically in his own day. And in addition, we have sources and resources today that were not accessible to him back then. And so we have all sorts of very nice translations of the writings of the fathers, etc., that he didn't have. And so he was reading and writing and translating, preparing these things for an audience in the church that didn't have access readily to all these things. We didn't have church, confer uh, co church conferences back then in all these different sections or uh, meetings for Orthodox youth. If they did, it was... Well, I won't comment, okay? <laughs> and uh, w w even monasteries. You went to a monastery back in the 1970s or 80s, chances are... The language of the worship was much closer to, as we used to say, Babylonian than it was to English. Okay? Now, that's all changed today. And so, the, uh, the, what, we're, how we're to live as Orthodox Christians, in a sense, doesn't change. But our, uh, how we interface with the world around us and our people and our neighbors, that's a totally different context than it was 45 years ago. Yeah, well, I think that uh, we have a very, uh, in his day, there was a very divided Orthodox mission. And I think in the maybe no. last 37, 38 years, fortunately, everything's got much better until very recently. <laughs> until maybe within the last year and a half or so. No. And to spend time 
Sometimes I think in 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 his day we're dealing with uh, that our access to the treasures of the Orthodox faith was such a big struggle, and that's not our struggle today. We have today, we're facing, we've kind of gone back to the divisiveness out of which the church was coming in the 1970s. Uh, I think uh, maybe if he had had the chance to form more common cause with like-minded missionaries and educators and people proclaiming the Orthodox faith, uh, that maybe he would have done that. He didn't have an op opportunity in his day, for example, to, look, for example, he did not know that within three to four years after his repose that Christianity in the former Soviet Union would absolutely blossom. And so, in a way, he was still kind of addressing a legacy from the uh, early 20th century of kind of trying to combat a uh, mm, combat the problems that I think that were uh, assumed were really handcuffing the church in the uh, Eastern Europe. I think there's things that he would maybe uh, review. Um, there's also, for example, there were people with whom he was corresponding who really may have influenced how he saw the mission of the church at his time. And, uh, you know, I think you can get, uh, I think also he... He used some of his time uh, having to address the uh, teachings and errors of some other people who, in a way, maybe he could have used his time much better. Uh, so, yes, I, th I, think, I think definitely it's, it's quite possible. Uh, what specifically? I don't know if I, I, if there's really to pinpoint that. Uh, I think also that he didn't. And one of the things he lacked is he actually lacked a uh, well-rounded theological education that maybe wasn't just available to him at his time. He had to kind of teach himself in a way. Uh, he didn't have, you know, what he had to learn about the Orthodox Church. He learned from a kind of uh, a limited, you could say limited gene pool, per se, and a limited experience of the Church. Because shortly after, you know, within a couple of years after his repose, we had large groups of people coming to the Orthodox Church. We had... Uh, hundreds and really thousands of churches being opened up and people were thirsty to learn. And maybe that really wasn't happening precisely at the end of the 1980s, uh, end of the 1970s, beginning of the 1980s, but everything changed within about six, seven years. And so I think he would have responded, much, responded in a much different way if he had had that opportunity to respond to the questions and needs that people had even five sh sh uh, short five years later. All right, as the saying goes, nothing finer than life in Platina. Okay, <laughs> so a lot of those things were moved to his cell after he reposed. Okay, some of those things weren't there when he was living. Okay. And number one, Number two, we, li we live uh, actually between his time, around his time and now. We've been under this influence that we have a lot of new time-saving devices. 
don't believe it. We live amidst distraction, voluntary distraction. And if a person is raised well, taught well, they learn to focus, they learn to pay attention, they learn to read carefully, they actually to learn to write well and think clearly. And actually, I think he had that uh, background in formation, where he learned how to study, how to read, how to pay attention, how to write, how to express himself clearly, and how to think clearly. And the opposite of that is a life of distraction, thinking that with all these time-saving gadgets and devices, we're, quote-unquote, saving time or saving money. And so we've come to the end of that now, where we realize our lives are cluttered. We have so much stuff that one of the big businesses is storage units, and one of the big activities is garage sales, etc., and estate sales. And we're choking ourselves, choking ourselves out of existence. So, yes, he was able to simply... Open. And one of the great things he did, by the way, one of the things he loved to do, was since he was a graduate at UC Berkeley, is every few months to go down to the library in Berkeley and as a uh, graduate or graduate student there, for alumni, he was able to check books out of the library there and he valued that. And he always had some interesting thing that he borrowed or later photocopied. You remember the old days, the photocopy machine, Kinko's, etc., all those kind of a, that bygone era. Okay. And uh, he had all these fabulous things that he would collect and research and read and this process of study brought to him clarity. Instead of this pile of information or this digital maze. And I think that also it pours over into the spiritual life. Where you're simply able to focus, stand up and pray. Make prostrations. Reflect. And when you're in church, instead of simply being bombarded by thoughts and other information ideas, you need to pour forth your heart. So he was able to do this. And yes, his cell was not the same when he was alive. He actually was able to use his bookshelves after he reposed. Things that had actually belonged to him were brought to his cell. Okay? Uh, however, however, it still was cramped and tight. And yes... Uh, the building was substandard, etc., and later had to be lifted up and that the foundation improved, and that's to be understood. All right. Okay. So, now, many of the things about which he wrote are things about which he was asked to write. In the, again, go go back to the late 1970s, there were a lot of questions that people were asking at that time. There was almost no books on soul after death, life after death, eschatology, etc. And there were lots and lots of things being written in the world around us at that time on these questions. It's like today when you think, oh, the church needs to respond to this question. Okay, well, where are you going to get a book like that? Who had a book for like... And some of the things that appeared in print were totally unsatisfactory. So he has asked to write a whole series of articles on these questions. Some of it, he was able to write these articles and put them in a book form. Other materials had in preparation that were never put in a book form or companion book form. Now, in... Also at that time, in response to some of these articles, which have been serialized in the periodical, the Orthodox Word, there also been some pushback by some other people. And so he had to spend disproportionate time responding to some of these critics. Now, I would say this is that in some aspects of the teaching of the soul after death, there are, some of the material is taken from not the creed, but church services, lives of saints, a sermon, or something like that, and 
There are, for example, types of images that are used. There's things, for example, that haven't been revealed. For example, how do the saints reign with God? All right. How are the dead going to rise from the grave? The voice of the last trumpet, what does that mean? So not all these questions are very crystal clear, either in Scripture or in our dogmatic statements. So Herman's question, in that sense, is quite apropos. And those are some of the things about which Father Seraphim is kind of most criticized. So that's why he has made this comment. Okay? So, for example, if the basis of a somehow doctrinal teaching is a vision, okay, that's like, for example, having the basis of your doctrine of salvation based on a rhetorical question, okay, such as, for example, Calvinism. All right? So, uh, there are some things that, for us that are very clear, that have been clarified by the councils of the church. For example, the union in two natures, God and man and Jesus Christ. And for example, things like that are the most clarified teachings of our church. There are other things set forth by the church that are, have not been as clearly set forth or described. All right? And some things are celebrated in our creed, our symbol of faith, that have not only been proclaimed by the ecumenical councils, but received and used even uh, in a very central liturgical manner about which there can be no doubt or question. Others, for example, we have, uh, for example, in the creed itself, we have a statement, and became man, and the next phrase is, and he was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. So you have the coming man and crucified under Pontius Pilate. You have a little bit of a gap there. The rest of that has to be filled in, and it's not filled in in our creed. So there are some things in which the councils go and very clearly set forth how he is both God and man. So other things that are not described, that is, his going through Galilee and teaching, etc., and that leaves it open, for example, to um, people trying to uh, reconstruct the chronology of, of how many years he preached and ministered or how many times he actually visited Jerusalem to try to create some sort of harmony between all the evangelists. So some things are set forth very clearly in the teaching and doctrinal statements of the church. Other things are not quite set forth so clearly in the doctrinal statements of the church. I have a uh, follow-up question. I don't know. Um, so you said back in uh, the 1980s and 1970s there was a uh, division in the church, and then now there's also a current division, which we know is caused mostly by COVID, probably. And no, uh, no, no, no. That's uh, maybe that's here among, especially our North Texans, for example, yeah. our <laughs> conspiracy theory-oriented North Texans, maybe. <laughs> But no, that's not where the divisions of the church were. For example, divisions in the church, for example, where, where uh, one autocephalous church actually breaks communion with another. That's the type of division I'm talking about. Not about uh, whether you need to wear one or two masks or no yeah, yeah. masks or something like that, or whether you should get up in the middle of an airplane and say orthodoxy or death or something, take your mask off. No. That's kind of what I was referring to. But, but can you go more into the our modern division that we have, and also how it compares to the previous division that uh, was in the church in the 1980s or 70s. Yes, okay. Let's just say that, just a little background, since okay. you're obviously yeah. not 50 years old. All right, so in the 1970s, 1980s, there was a lot of polarization here in the United States in the Orthodox Church. We had, for example, you had... Uh, uh, churches that were divided. For example, there were, in many cities, two Serbian Orthodox churches. All right? Others, the Antiochians, had just healed a division. 
there was a time that the OCA and the Rokor parishes not only didn't have communion, but uh, would even call each other heretics or schismatics. And then Rokor and the Moscow Patriarch, they wouldn't even talk to each other. They'd walk on opposite sides of the road or something like that, or establish a parish, two parishes in the same town on the same block. And then you had uh, people who thought that this patriarch Athenagoras, who had, quote unquote, lifted the anathemas against the Roman Catholic, that he was an apostate, etc. So there was a lot, and then you had people, a new calendar people, an old calendar, they didn't serve together. You had the so called Greek old calendar churches. And if that wasn't enough, you had another Greek old calendar church, which wasn't with this Greek old calendar church, it was with this Greek old calendar church. Okay? So this was all over the place in the night. And then you had the phenomena, which really you don't hear much about today, is there will be also the Vagantis, or these bishops going around ordaining this person and that person, this person, that person, and people trying to show their pedigree to prove that they were canonical. It's like a waste of human energy and effort. All for the fact that really ultimately not believing in one holy Catholic apostolic church. Okay? So, fortunately, in the 1980s and 1990s we, and early 2000s, we really moved away from that quite a bit. But you might be under a similar impression. Okay. Hopefully I'm not making too much of a character. Okay, so, and then in the last few years... More recently, some of somehow dis descending back towards that. Yeah, some of it was irritated or stirred up by this COVID stuff, but people didn't actually break communion over that. I mean, not that I know of. And, uh, but then we have this most recent division following in the wake of the Council of Crete, of uh, the Antiochian and Jerusalem churches failing to resolve their issue of communion, then the Russian Orthodox not wanting to, uh, the, the, the Patriarch of Constantinople uh, receiving some Ukrainian bishops as bishops into communion with the ecumenical patriarch and calling them the Orthodox Church of Ukraine, and then Moscow ceasing to have communion with the ecumenical patriarchate, and then etc. And then starting parishes in Africa, etc. Just all sorts of strange things doing now that really do not reflect one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. Okay? And since we've been trying for decades to go against that current, some of the more recent things are a little disheartening. Okay? That's okay. what I meant. Right. Another follow up. Yes. So you said that before they had been moving more towards healing a lot of these. Yes. Things, yes. We can learn from how they did that before. Yes. To keep more from coming and maybe heal what's happening now. Yeah, really good. Fantastic of leadership. Not your leaders. Leaders coming together. And, for example, uh, the Serbian Orthodox churches that they resolved to do away with that division they had from 1962 to, what, 1992 or some, 2002 or something like that. It took them a long time, but they did it. Okay, the Antiochans did it earlier. They had a, and, and then, during that time period, also, this uh, kind of, these Greek old calendar groups just kind of drifted away people uh, and then various uh, and then we had the uh, Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia rec being reconciled with Moscow Patriarchate and so there was a whole series of these divisions which were finally resolved they're all unnecessary and uh, uh, that was a really is to see People coming into uh, Eucharistic communion, because how do we express ourselves? We could say, oh, every, we're the Church of the Councils. We're the Church of the Council that doesn't gather in council. Okay. <laughs> and so, seeing this movement where everyone gathering together and celebrating that unity is actually a wonderful, beautiful thing. So that's what I would point at. That's why it's important. I'm a little narrow-minded. Yes. Next. 
Yes? And getting back to the Tecon stuff, the theme of what's like Wait, repeat that? We're, we're, we're going back to Tecon's theme of? It's later than you think. Yes. Um, Eschatologically speaking, yes. do you think that the events of the last two years are business as usual, eschatologically, or has something <laughs> Well, I have to tell you, unfortunately, I don't have a revelation about this, so I can't really tell you too much more than that. Uh, however, we are to be ready. I'm not going to go preach and say that you have to go build bomb shelters and this and that and have nuclear war, etc., and buy a reed canic over Leibowitz, etc. So, most of you don't know what that is, okay. And, uh, however... I, th I, I think that our communities need to value what we do have here and to come together and put these first things first. It is the time of Lent. It is a time to reach out. There are people who are in great need. Uh, what will come, we don't know. But one thing we do know, I can guarantee you, money back, money back guarantee, you're going to have a number of new people in your parish from Eastern Europe. You're going to have people coming into your communities from Ukraine. That's something you're going to have. Now, I don't know. I cannot tell you. Uh, however, you definitely have wars and rumors of wars. And everybody knows that there are elements of our U.S. economy that benefit from a long-term proxy war, unfortunately. But beyond wars and rumors of wars and things like that and disease, etc., that's something that we should know that is taking place. But that doesn't mean we're too... Mm, you know, if you're, good, if you're good fundamentalists, for example, and you see these things, you go buy, borrow money from banks because you won't have to pay it back. Okay? The Lord's coming again. You, won't, you could enjoy the money now. You want to pay it back. Okay? I don't know. I can't, I can't tell you any of that. But we are to be. We are to be vigilant and watchful. And John, you'll accept some of the loans, people extra money, right? For development? Okay. See, John, if you have extra. Okay? <laughs> And, uh, but we're, we're to be watchful. And, and this is a time for us to be very serious about Orthodox Christian life. But it, shouldn't do, it should not have the effect that somebody decides, oh, this is, Scripture says, this is not a time to get married. This is not a time to have children. We quit our jobs. No, that's, that's, that should not be our response. Uh, you know, or buy the Y2K food, etc., to stock up, extra generator. This is not about uh, the creating a survivalist mentality. Because there's nothing that's taking place now that isn't mentioned as one of those signs of the times in Scripture. But I'm not pointing to any timeline. I'm, I'm just, I don't have, I'm blinded by my sins and passions and can't give you any further clarity. <coughs> yes? Good question. Uh, in, in a Western society, it's been long established that the favorable condition is the separation of church and state. Yes. And uh, obviously that leads to, you know, uh, some of the problems like postmodernism or whatever, where people can define anything however they want. Yes. I can. I don't know about you. Yeah. But, but on the other hand, it, it, it leads to uh, spiritual competition. And those of us who are aware of the benefits of competition know that it's good for people to compete in the world of ideas. Good America. Oh, yes. Good America. Excellent. Uh, in Russia, yes. uh, the church and the state are bound together. And the church, the Orthodox Church exerts a monopoly power over other religions. For example, Catholics can't come into Russia and evangelized, they'll be kicked out. They're limited, limited, yes. They're, they're greatly limited. So yes. uh, there, there is a, a sense of a kind of a, that the church is a sort of monopolistic posture. Yes. The spiritual life in spiritual yes. In, in Russia. How do you see those questions being resolved and evolving? Okay, first of all, it's a total disaster. 
All right? And right now, our mission is suffering because of it. Okay? If there's any kind of identification of church and state right now, it looks really, really bad on the Orthodox Church. It's a terrible thing right now, and everything was going so beautifully until about the end of February for our mission, our outreach, and everything. And this is, this is total disaster. And this is why we have to be very sober when there is some sort of proximity between church and state. It's something about which to be very careful. The historical lessons are all very painful. The historical lessons during the Turkish period were total disaster. Uh, so, and, and the, there were a lot of problems leading up to the Russian Revolution where there were people, especially intellectuals and things like that, that shied away from the church because of the close symphony between church and state. And then we saw what happened during the communist period. And the church losing credibility during the communist period when there were uh, bishops who seemingly had the approval of the state. For example, there are people who came from the former Soviet Union to the West who, for example, they didn't have much of an experience of confession because there was this possibility that maybe the, <clears throat> the bishops or priests were reporting to the KGB. Okay? To what extent? I mean, anybody who's a priest, anybody who knows a pri is a priest knows that most confessions are like bad TV reruns. Okay? <laughs> this is, in a way, it was boring. <laughs> Somebody comes up and they're going to tell you they had milk in their coffee or something like that. Is this a challenge? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Or, you know, they got they were irritated. Okay. It's like bad TTV reruns. Okay. So, yes. But there are people who didn't go to confession. They didn't have that practice in their life because they were had some sort of fear. Okay. And then after the collapse of the Soviet Union, there was a lot of support, even financial support, authority that the church had in the former Soviet Union. But that's not necessarily good because it weakens the church's ability to be, have a prophetic voice. All right? So, and that, uh, and, and, and we're feeling that right now. It's a problem right now, a compromise in the mission of the Orthodox Church throughout the entire world right now. So if you want to come up, you come back with your, another part of your question, maybe I didn't touch on it properly. I don't know if that's what you... The Catholic Church is facing similar issues with trying to have bishops ordained in China who would be approved by the Chinese government and therefore, and, and you know, in, in a communist society where uh, people regularly uh, inform on each other you know, even your family informs on them, then yes, the, the, it would be a crisis of trust. Yes, uh, yes. The Orthodox Church also has a little bit of that in China, too. Uh, that's why you know, I'm sure you've, since you evidently read some of this material, etc., interesting Matteo Ricci and the Chinese rights controversy, all these questions are fascinating. That's why also, even though this movie was called Silence, is that what it's called? Jake was very interesting on this question. He did, maybe he's kind of a Liam Neeson fan, etc. But uh, th this uh, is, it's an important question. And how do you remain faithful amidst these circumstances? And the idea is, is it's not necessarily better, and we know it's not, when the church is, when the state is supportive of the church, or the church supported it. It's actually... The, the dangers come in. Yes, it's dangerous. It compromises the church's witness. Yes? Uh, question. I've been speaking a lot about the 1970s and 80s. Uh, I was only in my 20s then. So I know something about the 70s. Uh, 
there was a very famous Life magazine photograph. Yes. Yes. It's one of two. The other one you don't know of. Yes. Yes, and others. Yes. Why did he have so much problem? Wait, repeat that question. Why did he, he as the bishop, have so much problem after that? He did. He did. Because, because that was one photo op. The Greek Orthodox leaders were not supportive of him in that picture. They liked the fact that a Greek was on the cover of Life magazine, but they didn't, weren't necessarily that supportive. They were supportive of civil rights for Greeks, but they didn't necessarily approve of what he was doing. And there are some other people right behind him was uh, Walter Ruther, head of what, UAW, etc. And then a friend of mine's aunt, a Catholic nun, right in front, Josephine, I think. Uh, is it, but it's a, uh, I, uh, I wish that more often you saw Orthodox leaders making some sort of bold step of leadership, in, even in an unpopular cause. Uh, and it's all right if it's, uh, sometimes we make a decision or something which maybe isn't that well advised. Uh, but yes, because the entire hierarchy and leadership of the Greek Orthodox was not supportive of him being in Birmingham and marching. There were Catholic priests at that time who were very much side by side with workers' rights and the rights of minorities, African Americans, and they had some support also from Jewish leadership. But it wasn't across the board. But that's leadership. Yes. Yes, it, it is. God bless him. Yes. Just one other question. How do you, you talk about separation of church and state? Yes. Eastern kind of influence the other, perhaps sometimes at all. Yes. Do you not see the challenges? Let's not mention who. Let's just say some very right wing churches trying to influence the United States government. Yes. Yeah, and that's also that, that also has not been helpful. There are people who want nothing to do with Christianity because of how certain religious leaders have kind of tried to ride the tide and try to make the message of the church and the state the same. And I'm saying that as somebody who has traveled here from Dallas, Texas. And so we have lots of groups, especially one specific minister in Dallas, Texas, for example, that has tried to be very vocal and um, uh, championing American values and American, the American outlook for the benefit of, to, to kind of be the face of Christianity. But, uh, uh, so for example, and this is not to attack Greeks, there are a number of Greek Orthodox leaders that have backed initiatives or positions the U.S. government who has been very sympathetic to pro-abortion rights, for example. Uh, and some Orthodox Christians, many of them, absolutely cringe at this. this is, how can this man as an Orthodox Christian say that we support that? Okay. And then we have uh, others that will, uh, so it actually, it ultimately, in a way, it compromises our witness. And it compromises, it, it, it actually is saying something that this is, and uh, we're supposed to make the proclamation of gospel authentic, uh, not, not trying to tie it to a political party or movement or idea or platform. And when we do that, uh, people are turned off by what they see as Christianity. And so that's, I think, and we're still, we, we suffer from that all the time. It compromises our ability to proclaim the Christian faith because of the way Christian leaders behave. And uh, then later they're, 
deeds come out and they come toppling down and people are scandalized, etc., etc. And this happens repeatedly. Uh, fortunately, I can you know there were times in history when the Orthodox Church was not prominent, and maybe it's good they weren't prominent at that moment. Uh, we have, for example, in, in, don't get mad, California. There are people today in California who equate Roman Catholicism with torturing Amer uh, California Indians. Now, this is a uh, selected version of how they want to read history. That's actually not what took place, but that's how that's kind of a popular view in California, and they dismiss Christianity because of this. And there's many, many cases uh, like this, uh, like the uh, uh, conquest of South America and the killing of Atahualpa. It's uh, also a similar thing where uh, they had a Catholic priest bring supposedly in the gospel book this Atahualpa and he was supposed to accept the word of God and supposedly he his either he or his Inca leader etc put his ear to it and said he didn't hear anything it's the word of God okay and so they rejected they didn't instead of embracing the Christian faith they would they didn't they did not they, 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 it was presented in such a way they did not embrace the Christian faith. Uh, and so it sets back the mission of the church time and again. Okay, so this really is uh, two years ago, terra incognita. There was no evidence going forward of what on earth we would encounter. People didn't know exactly how to respond. In the Greek archdiocese, they were perhaps some of the fastest to respond. with some fairly strict protocol. And they were led in this discussion by Metropolitan Nathaniel of Chicago, who has a PhD in bioethics, PhD in public health. So he has a little background in this realm. And the after two or three weeks, Archbishop Elpidophorus had a couple ordinations. And he kind of skipped the protocol. And six people from one of those ordinations ended up in the hospital right away. And so his leader said, look, you're not listening. You didn't listen to what you even instructed everybody to do. We're going to lose you too. So they clamped down a little bit more. Now, a lot of our bishops are in, and if you were to get a whole list of them, they're in New York, Chicago, Boston, Los Angeles, San Francisco. By and large, they're in cities. They're in large cities. Okay. Most of our parishes in the Diocese of the South are not in large cities. And the requests for the clergy were kind of uh, across the board the same. Whether you had a people, a parish of 20 people in North Dakota or a par parish of several thousand in Los Angeles, the kind of rules were the same. Because they just didn't want to leave it be a free for all. Okay, so yes. In the cities, maybe it was pretty careful. We have a friend who a, owns a funeral home in Dallas, and he has a partner in New York City. They were going along picking up bodies, and there was nowhere to bury people. The only people who could bury people were Jews because they owned their own cemeteries in New York. Everybody else had to ship people three or four hours outside of New York City to bury people. Now, our circumstances in Texas were totally different. Yours here and down here in South Carolina were totally different. 
But by and large, the bishops were making these decisions and they were mostly in the larger cities. And you might not believe this, but most of the bishops are over 60. Okay? There are not many teenagers. So, the people that were making decisions were primarily older. The people for whom they were making them, they had in view primarily protecting the more elderly people. We didn't quite know it was coming. If you lived in northern Italy, we had some friends in northern Italy, and the people coming back from Chinese New Year into northern Italy, these factories, textile factories, Chinese, Chinese had brought up in northern Italy, they had the Italians dropping like flies in northern Italy. That's what the reality was. I had friends in Ecuador, people in Ecuador, they were leaving bodies all over the street. Okay. As we know, these things have come in waves, immunity comes in waves. At that time, they didn't have any vaccines. So, yes, let's say that the response was a little too heavy-handed. And it wasn't tailored to the local region. So, Nobody had any proof of what was coming. And because of that, there were some rather strict regulations put in place. If we could review a tape, a videotape of the last two years, and have all the data and evidence, well, we would probably do it totally different. But we didn't have a videotape of what was going to happen. And uh, if any of you have done much international traveling over the last 20 years, you may have seen sometimes going through international airports, uh, I use the right word, Asian people with their faces covered going through the airports, etc., because they've de dealt with some of these things. Americans don't like that, especially in the South. You can't tell anybody what to do, especially in North Texas. <laughs> so yeah, if we had to go through it all over again, and we had some good videotape and evidence and charts, it'd be done differently. But that wasn't available to us at the time. So yes, people are bummed out, upset. Other words I won't use, etc. And so people had different reactions. I get it, but I served every single Sunday for the last two years, I think. I don't think I missed a day. And it's, I'm still standing. Right, but I get it, you know. It's, uh, and the hierarchs had actually responsibility on their shoulders for this. We're fortunate we didn't have to go through things like they have in San Francisco. A clergy person in San Francisco, they had their uh, services broadcast only to parishioners. And they did not distribute communion during the liturgy. They turned the tape off at the end of liturgy and they had whoever happened to be in church, unnamed, come up and receive communion afterwards. That was one way they went around it, okay? Very carefully. Out the back door into their cars. Everybody did something different. More or less. That was real core. Okay? Other places, they had distributing Holy Communion link with tongs into their mouth. Okay? All right, everybody did something different. And uh, some people had you can imagine what it's like in San Francisco by the way with Gavin Newsom's buddies all ready to close down a church if they could find that somebody did something wrong so we weren't under that kind of scrutiny in Dallas so very fortunate I'm glad we didn't have to go through that stuff so some people rolled with it etc and some people are still really upset and angry and resentful, etc. Hey, get on with your lives. Did anybody remember the advertisements for Kennel Ration? 
my dog's better than your dog. My dog's better than yours. My dog's better because he eats kennel ration. My dog's better than yours. We have this thing called the heresy, the immaculate jurisdiction. We've come a long ways, but so there's a lot of work to do. Again, it's one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Anything that deviates from that already shows there's a problem in ecclesiology, sacramental theology, uh, everything. Yes, it's the absolutely most unhelpful thing for the Orthodox Church. And we have, we do not have to apologize for anybody's bad decisions. We don't justify anyone's bad decisions. It created an absolute total humanitarian crisis, entire diplomatic crisis. It's a, it's a, a cancer that's taking place right now. We have no idea what mess it's going to lead us all into. It points to a total breakdown of ability, abilities to practice diplomacy. And believe it or not, I'm really naive, but I hope Israel takes a step forward and becomes the key negotiator in this and really pulls off something imaginative. I don't know what's going to happen, but it's just bad news right now. For everybody, uh, it's, it's tragic, it's disappointing. We have at least 20 parishioners, I think, from Ukraine in our parish. We have about 25% of our cathedral is from East Europe. About 50% of those are Russia, 50% from Ukraine with a little balance of people from other places. And the people from Ukraine are mostly... Ukrainian. Most of them, however, are Russian speaking. And they all have relatives. Some, of the rel some have relatives they cannot find, cannot talk to. Others are, have emigrated over the border to Romania, some back into Russia, some to Western Ukraine. It's an absolute total mess, uh, totally unnecessary, etc. And it's a disaster on every front. Well, we don't live in a vacuum. We live in this world. Yes, for years I lived on top of a mountain on a mo in a monastery. But most of us live in this world. We're responsible. We are, in a way, has bear some responsibility for the actions and decisions of our leaders insofar as they are elected leaders. We're responsible also in, to some extent of how those decisions are implemented in our society, the society in which we live. We also have the great privilege in this society of being uh, in, on juries in which people are, uh, in which cases are decided or, or adjudicated and resolved. We have uh, leaders who don't always represent their constituents well. And some that do so shamefully. We have, uh, uh, but also as human beings, we also vote with our money. Even where we shop, how we educate our children. the events in which we participate. For example, I hope that you at least have a sense of humor. I spent all of last year teaching our parishioners to go to church on January 6th. Those on the old calendar, they needed to be in church on January 6th for the services for Eve of Nativity. And those on the new calendar be in their churches for the liturgy and blessing of water on Theophany. 
Actually, people, listen, we had a good turnout this year on January 6, 2020, in the biting cold with a nasty wind blowing down through Dallas. We had an outdoor blessing of water. It was the best one we ever had attended. So it took a little bit of repeating, maybe even a little sarcastically throughout the year, that I expected to be in church in January 6th. So uh, in other words, we can, as priests, speak of the behavior of our parishioners, what we expect them to do, how they, we expect them to behave themselves. And Orthodox Christians also are responsible for their own choices, the decisions that they make, uh, how they even act out on social media, for example. People, I, you know, I get these people send to me these conspiracy theory videos, links for them every single day. I had one, for example, with a, it's a doormat. And the doormat, it had a picture of Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, and Nancy Pelosi. Orthodox Christian doesn't wipe his feet on people's faces, no matter who they are. You just don't do that. It's not appropriate. No matter who you like or don't like, you don't deface the human, the, the human face, the image of God in a person. So... Uh, and now we're facing the consequences of the fact that people who call themselves Orthodox Christians have, inst have, have, have escalated conflict to a level of war. And this does not represent us well. It shows that we don't care about the well-being of our neighbor. Now, I know there's a whole backstory to this. I'm very aware of that. And what is the, you know, when I started set, talking about conspiracy theories, by the way, the phone started ringing, yes. <laughs> uh, vibrating, I, I keep it on silent all the time, yes. So, uh, and, and our task is not simply to condemn, our task is to be peacemakers, to be merciful, not to walk by on the other side to go and pour oil and wine on those who are suffering and to be creative, to provide solutions, to teach. How many of you are teachers or professors? Okay, excellent. This is an important profession. You come, you shape people. You educate them. You make, you give them tools. This is what we do and, it, and, and, it's, and it's, it's sad if the for example, if the face of the Orthodox Church in any country is doing something which doesn't proclaim the gospel, this is the absolute worst advertising for our church. In front of your church, you have St. John of the Ladder. And of course, you know what's going to happen. Everybody's going to come into your church inside your church and see the scaffolding and say, <laughs> that's why it's called St. John of the Ladder Orthodox Church. They have a ladder going up there, and that's heaven up there. You go up there, and they sit up there, and they talk about heaven. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm joking. But well, you can guess how many rungs there are on that ladder. 30. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know exactly. It's, it's theologically correct, yes. <laughs> so... Yeah, so uh, we, and, and, and it's, uh, and that's why right now it's just, it's, it's really bad anytime, anytime our church somehow becomes the face of conflict. And it's a, it's an absolute disaster. And that's why when you brought up that the image of someone, especially a, you know, for a Greek Orthodox hierarch walking side by side with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in a peaceful march, of course, no weapons. This does send it, it sends a beautiful image side by side with another human being. And uh, this, this is what we would prefer to be the image of the church. Or even 
this year, some of you have maybe passed unnoticed here, but this Sunday, it's actually an appropriate thing to mention. A friend of mine passed away, is it January, I think? Uh, Jim Forrest, he was the head of the Orthodox Peace Fellowship. He even wrote a book called The Ladder of the Beatitudes. And uh, I was thinking about him this week. I met him back in, I think, 1980, 1990 in Alkmaar in Nederland. Really wonderful man. He came out of a very kind of specific time and place. He came out of the Catholic worker movement in the late 70s and became an Orthodox Christian. And he was very involved in inner Orthodox work and in inner Catholic Orthodox work in Europe. He was an expatriate living the rest of his life over in Holland because I think he felt more akin there to being a citizen of that country than being one here in the United States. Uh, and I think he would have just been torn in pieces if he saw what was, heard what was taking place now, uh, kind of undermining of everything that he felt he should stand for. Uh, so... You know, what would be the best opportunity? The best opportunity is for Orthodox Christians to do what they believe in doing. Even if, even if it uh, costs them, even if they get arrested, thrown in jail, uh, not to explode about it. Uh, we have, for example, people that go to anti-abortion demonstrations and sometimes they're arrested, and they go through this process. This is their, this is their crime, okay? And they sit there because they, they viol maybe violated a law at a certain point, okay? But they, okay, this is the process. They disagree with this law at that time. And uh, so it's always, and for, and for us, it's a witness to do with our life what that in which we believe, so right now, there's so many of us that just wish this, this war would stop tomorrow or today. Uh, that yeah. Somehow people's hearts would be attentive to realizing this is not the path of God. And to do something about it. And those people would be heroes. They would be, they would, history would look back at them as heroes. Somebody with the, with the right time at the right moment did uh, did something that was the action of a true leader. And that would be a really wonderful, wonderful thing if uh, Orthodox Christians were the ones who were taking the initiative to always make the right decisions and right actions at the right <coughs> moment. And that would be beautiful. Yes? Follow a question on what you're saying. Um, uh, I think we, the, there was a great flourishing of uh, religion in the post-Soviet uh, regions, uh, countries, uh, after the fall of communism, but perhaps we exaggerated that. There were a lot of churches built. Uh, I still hear statistics that only one and a half percent of people in Russia actually go to church. Uh, I don't know whether those statistics are true or not, but I've heard 1.5, 1.7. So, so the question is, um, the, the Orthodox Church in Russia is only compromised to the extent that it supports the state uh, in its activities, it supports Putin, because there's a close relationship between Putin and Kirill. But is church really to be blamed? And, you know, I, I don't know that the majority of people that are out there either being conscripted or doing the fighting or uh, engaging in war crimes or uh, even, you know, that they're necessarily religious people or Christian people. So, so are we not being tainted by association only because maybe of, of the uh, um, perfidity of, of, of church leadership? Yeah, this is part of it. But also, every day in the news there is a driven, a narrative is driven, and there's titles and pictures and captions. And even for example, a very simple picture, for example, people see a picture of red square, or beautiful square, with an Orthodox church. 
it says something even if it has nothing to do with the church making the decision to do those things. People in our country also make the dis sometimes make an association of Russian with Orthodox. Okay? And unfortunately they don't necessarily make the same association with Ukrainian and Orthodox or Belarusian and Orthodox. Uh, people who their their news agencies try to sell news because it needs the money for advertising, which supports them, which pays their salaries. So that's unfortunate part of it, and uh, so. But also, I think that our voice is not heard strong enough, and. If what people heard throughout the world is that the Orthodox Church does not support bombing or war or things like that, but comes out with specific, clear, consistent statements, then we also are able in that way to express our voice. Or, for example, to point out okay, what the Church of Romania has done or uh, the various humanitarian missions. There, there's always an opportunity to exp how do we serve in this manner? How, who are the negotiators, for example? Who goes over? Uh, for example, during the Yugoslavia crisis, for example, they had uh, not only different senators, but they had, for example, different religious leaders that went over there. Some of them were Orthodox Christian leaders that went over there to help negotiate. Some of them were other uh, leaders of other religious bodies. Who's ready to go and speak? Uh, or even in our own parishes, presenting uh, just simply, you know, for example, our people in our parish know that every service we have these lists of the parishioners who have friends and relatives in Ukraine who we're praying for by name in every service. Our people know that. They know that that's where, okay, we're expressing that. Uh, and I think this is a good activity by which we express who we are, that we pray. We're ready to contribute. Uh, we allow where somebody hosting refugees, making it possible. Um, it's whatever we can do, and and not necessarily and not necessarily something political. Okay, so that uh, uh, we. Speak for peace, for prayer, reconciliation, and hospitality, and relief. And that should be how we express our, and not necessarily in a, uh, let's say, political or uh, journalistic way. But you will find that the voices for peace and reconciliation don't necessarily get the uh, that's not what everybody knows, and that's unfortunate. Did you burn up those words? Did a voice whisper absurd? If you'd last till the end Traded money and lands Family dreams and plans For a desert exile And a life of trials